everything, pretend to know nothing, but know it all. These words would be written in his book Behind the Staircase, released in 2019, but perhaps this was the same mantra that Michael Peterson held 18 years prior. Durham, North Carolina is known as Bull City, a city of learning and development, but with a friendly feel. With its rolling hills, hot, humid summers and cool winters, Durham is rich in history, but with a lively entertainment scene. Three major research universities, Duke, North Carolina State, and UNC at Chapel Hill, form the research triangle in the Piedmont region of the city. Here, world-class teaching, research and medicine, and tech innovation draw students and scientists looking for lifelong careers. Durham, like every city, has some safe and then some less favourable areas. But Forest Hills, where the Petersons lived, was both exclusive and exquisite. The sprawling colonial house, with five bedrooms and six bathrooms, was surrounded by greenery. Trees and bushes muffled the noise from busy streets and the outdoor pool felt more like a secluded vacation spot than part of a family home. Inside the mansion was a games room, library and a grand curved staircase. So prominent and magnificent was this staircase that when Michael and Kathleen were married on the property in 1997, they chose to feature this grand staircase in their wedding pictures. However, there was one more staircase in the home modest by comparison and nestled at the back of the house, which would transpire to be even more significant in the events that followed. Michael Ivor Peterson was born October 23rd in 1943, near Nashville in Tennessee, the son of Eugene and Eleanor Peterson. Michael attended Duke University, graduating with a bachelor's degree in political science. As a student, Michael was president of the Sigma Nu Fraternity and the editor of The Chronicle, the daily student newspaper from 1964 to 1965. Michael would go on to write again for The Chronicle in 2000 and 2001, discussing the state of the city and anecdotes about his time at Duke. After graduating in 1965, Michael Peterson took a civilian job with the United States Department of Defence. That year, he also married Patricia Sue, often called Patty. Patty took work teaching as an elementary school teacher on the Rhein Main Air Base in Grafenhausen, West Germany, where Michael would later join her. They would go on to have two children, both boys, Clayton, born December 13th, 1974, and Todd, born the 14th of March, 1976. However, Michael longed to be a writer I was enraptured by Hemingway and the notion of really living life and being part of the process, rather than merely commentating on others' experiences. The hard living and raw writing culture of the gritty streets with colourful characters could not be found from behind the desk of a typewriter. He had hoped for more. More living, more writing. Yet Michael would get his chance to change the trajectory of his life and writing career when commissioned into the United States Marine Corps in 1968, where he would serve in the Vietnam War. Ultimately, Michael would be honourably discharged on medical grounds, but his time at war would stay with him indefinitely and would feature heavily in his future written works. Throughout his time in Germany, Michael and Patty became close friends with another couple, Elizabeth and George Ratliff. Elizabeth taught alongside Patty and George also had military experience and so similar life events seemingly cemented the friendship. So much so that when George passed away in 1983, Michael stepped in as a father figure for Elizabeth's two daughters, Margaret and Martha, reading them stories, spending time in their home for meals, and helping with household chores. Elizabeth would pass away unexpectedly in 1985, and Michael and Patty became guardians for Margaret and Martha, who lived with them and their two boys. Michael and Patty's marriage was troubled though, and soon after, Michael would relocate to Durham in North Carolina. Martha and Margaret would join him soon after, 
followed closely by his two sons, and it is here he would meet Kathleen. Kathleen Hunt was born on the 21st of February 1953 in Greensboro, North Carolina, but grew up in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Social and hardworking, she was the editor of the school magazine and graduated top of her class. She was a pioneer, becoming the first woman to be accepted into the School of Engineering at Duke University in 1971. Her talent and leadership skills allowed her to climb the corporate ladder to executive level positions, earning six-figure salaries and the opportunity to travel. She met and married her first husband, Fred Atwater, and had one daughter, Caitlin. Fred and Kathleen divorced after Fred was allegedly unfaithful, and Kathleen and Caitlin moved to a new home on the same street as Michael Peterson. The petite woman with shoulder-length brown hair would meet the quirky writer when their children began playing together, and after growing close, began a romantic relationship. After living together as a blended family, Michael and Kathleen purchased their now infamous mansion in 1992. Having previously been used as a movie set for The Handmaid's Tale, the home had real character, alongside the luxurious space. 1810 Cedar Street was everything the family had dreamt of. The family had their shares of troubles over the next nine years. Raising five children is bound to be hard, but Michael and Kathleen's relationship seemed unshakable. The fun-loving and playful couple were reported to be soulmates by everyone who met them. Their marriage in 1997 only seemed to solidify this connection even more, as the couple appeared to go from strength to strength. Michael had written articles for a local paper and published books, while Kathleen continued to be successful in her work at telecommunications company Nortel. And despite a failed mayoral campaign in 1999 and a failed attempt to run for city council in November 2001, a month later, on December the 8th, Michael had a reason to celebrate. A recent book he co-authored with a friend had been given the green light to be turned into a movie. So Kathleen and Michael enjoyed champagne and wine while watching a video, America's Sweetheart, that Saturday night. Todd and some friends saw the couple briefly as they headed out to a party. When the movie finished, the couple moved outside to the pool area to finish their drinks before Kathleen headed indoors around midnight. She needed to be ready early the next day for a conference call at work. The exact details of what happened in the next two hours will never be known. But at 2.40am, Michael Peterson calls 911 and speaks to the operator, Mary Allen. He asked for help as his wife has had an accident. When asked what type of accident, Michael says she has fallen down some stairs. He states that she is still breathing but not conscious and asks him to come quickly. The operator asks how many stairs. Michael guesses 15 to 20 but isn't sure. He sounds panicked and upset and they are disconnected. Michael calls in again at 2.46am this time speaking to Tonya Pierce, asking where the ambulance is and stating that Kathleen is no longer breathing before the call disconnects again. Paramedics arrive at 2.48am, as does Michael's son Todd and his friends. Michael is barefoot and bloody and seems visibly upset and shaken. Kathleen lies slumped at the bottom of the back staircase, surrounded in blood. Her head rests on a towel saturated with blood. Her face points upwards. Her mouth open as if in shock. Her back and neck touch the bottom step as her legs protrude into the hallway. The walls are sprayed red, thick sheets of scarlet at the bottom of the wall, while other droplets stand alone and in clusters further up. Pools of blood seep out from underneath Kathleen's body as she is pronounced dead. She is 48 years old. The next day is Margaret's 20th birthday, but no one will celebrate. Instead of the usual cake and laughter, the police search the home. Kathleen's autopsy shows lacerations and contusions that are not consistent with a fall down some stairs. 
and they suspect she was attacked with a blunt object, such as a blowpoke or something of similar shape and size. Candice, Kathleen's sister, had purchased a blowpoke for Kathleen and other family members and had gifted these some time ago. While searching the home, the police report that no blowpoke is found. Michael insists that Kathleen's death was an accident, but also claims to have not witnessed what happened. He does, however, make it clear that he feels that there was no intruder in the property and that Kathleen was not attacked. Initially, when speaking with paramedics, Michael had said he went to turn off the pool lights and was gone only 10 minutes before returning and finding Kathleen at the bottom of the stairs. The autopsy proves this impossible. On the contrary, the brain had reduced blood flow for quite some time, approximately two hours, and so the 10 minutes that Michael Peterson suggested couldn't be accurate. Michael would then go on to say he'd stayed by the pool for hours, smoking his pipe after Kathleen had turned in for the night, and had found her upon re-entering the house. On December 20th, Michael is indicted for Kathleen's murder, and surrenders himself with his brother Bill and family by his side. All the children, including Caitlin, maintain that Michael is innocent, and that the death of Kathleen was a tragic accident. Kathleen's sisters echo this statement, stating that Michael and Kathleen were soulmates, and that the family are devastated by the loss. Michael himself speaks to the press, saying, Kathleen was my life. I've whispered her name in my heart a thousand times. She is there, and I can't stop crying. I would never have done anything to hurt her. Michael is taken into custody and has already hired a defence team. David Rudolph will serve as lead attorney, Thomas Maher, co-defence counsel, and Ron Garrett, private investigator. All three are confident in Michael's innocence and will attempt to prove this in court. Rudolph becomes a spokesperson for Michael for media purposes, and with his trademark beard and glasses, he will be instantly recognisable to the public throughout this time. The family spent Christmas and New Year's without Kathleen and now without Michael. The void of separation can be felt by all. More information has been given to the family regarding Kathleen's injuries and the sustained blood loss, and it has swayed opinion for some. Caitlin and Kathleen's sisters retract their support for Michael, instead believing that he attacked Kathleen intentionally. The other four children continue to stand by their father's side, as does Michael's two brothers, Bill and Jack. Neighbours and community members cannot conceive of Michael hurting Kathleen, and everyone interviewed has only positive things to say regarding their relationship. The same key phrases arise in each discussion surrounding the love and positivity in the marriage, the lack of any tensions, and Michael and Kathleen's almost cosmic partnership that everyone hopes to find in their life at least once. While the shock subsides on the outside, Michael is on the inside and uses his time in jail to interview some people on his own. He keeps a journal of his time locked up in the characters he meets. His writings are full of descriptive details mixed with anecdotes, nicknames and observations of their forced community. Whether Michael uses this as a coping mechanism or as a logbook that may feature in future writing, he would soon be facing the people of Durham again in the real world. On January the 14th, 2002, Michael posts bail and awaits his trial. And by February 2002, there is a film crew documenting the entire process and will continue to film for the duration. John Xavier de la Strade and his team tell the story from Michael's perspective and are in attendance at all of the major events that will follow. Meanwhile, Michael's defence are working feverishly to put forward the best case they can for Michael, but it's not going to be easy. Prosecutors are pursuing the theory that Michael beat Kathleen to death on the staircase and believe that evidence at the crime scene will show this. Items with blood evidence include Michael's clothes and tennis shoes, which have blood droplets on them although he wasn't wearing them when police arrived. Dwayne Deaver, their blood pattern analyst, suggests that Michael took off his shoes to try and stage the scene before help arrived. Kathleen also had a shoe imprint on the back of her shirt, 
strengthening the theory that she was attacked. Studying the autopsy results, David Rudolph and the team tried to discern how a fall could result in such extensive injury and blood loss. To help with this, they hired experts, including Dr. Henry Lee, a blood pattern analyst, and Dr. Werner Spitz, a forensic pathologist. Dr. Spitz is in agreement that the lacerations appear extremely violent and look like she's been beaten, but then he says when you really study it that that is not the case. There are no fractures to the skull or bruising to the brain, which is apparent in almost all beatings. He theorises that although there are many tears in the scalp, that these could have occurred at the same time, splitting the skin in multiple directions when Kathleen hit the stairs and then the wall. Dr. Lee agrees that the blood evidence could support this, but does remark that there is more blood at the crime scene than he would expect to see for both an accident and a beating. The blood is multi-layered, some dried before more accumulated, which may suggest that Kathleen lost consciousness for a period of time and then tried to stand and fell again. During this movement, more blood was lost. Dr. Lee finds no cast-off pattern to suggest a beating, but notices multiple areas where the blood seems to have been sprayed onto the wall. He suggests that as blood was running down Kathleen's face, that she was coughing it onto the wall, which accounts for the pattern and the spread of droplets at different heights. The staircase area is small and confined, and would have been extremely difficult for Michael to beat Kathleen in. Also, Kathleen was wearing flip-flops. She had been drinking, had Valium in her system, and the staircase is poorly lit and narrow. The team hopes that all of these things combined will provide enough reasonable doubt for a jury. Strangely, David Rudolph suggests leaving the staircase as it is, with walls stained in Kathleen's blood, for the duration of the case, and Michael agrees. For a time, this is boarded up. The family kitchen is beside the staircase, and throughout the documentary is shown many times. An uncomfortable truth next to the continuing normalcy of Michael and his children's daily activities. Meanwhile, the police have issued a second search warrant early in 2002, and this time sees Michael's computer. They discover that Michael has deleted multiple files in the day before Kathleen's death and two days after. The police have also discovered a large amount of adult material and websites that Michael has frequented. It transpires that Michael considers himself bisexual and on multiple occasions has previously had or tried to solicit intimate encounters from male escorts. Messages are later found arranging such a meeting that never went ahead due to the escort's schedule. This all occurred during Michael's marriage to Kathleen and will become a key factor in the state's case, serving as a primary motive for the attack to discredit Michael's character and also to shatter the illusion of an idyllic, happy marriage. Questions are also raised about whether the couple were in any kind of financial difficulty and if that was a possible motive, as Michael stood to gain a life insurance payout and coincidentally an accidental death payout from Kathleen's company. Meanwhile, Michael's lawyers try to understand the context of Michael's sexuality as he tries to explain that he felt like Kathleen knew he was bisexual and was okay with it. When questioned further, Michael states that although he and Kathleen never sat down and addressed the issue directly, that the arrangement was unspoken but understood. That Kathleen was not threatened by his desire to have intimate encounters with men. But rather, Michael feels like she knew that side of him. And the marriage was happy because she also knew that Michael loved her and only her. He had a relationship with Kathleen. He went for dinner with Kathleen. These encounters he would not consider a relationship. The defence team know that regardless of what arrangement Michael and Kathleen had, unspoken or otherwise, that convincing the jury would be difficult. People's ideals of what a committed marriage is would not be compatible with Michael's version and could provide doubt in any juror's mind. Michael also admits to being unfaithful throughout his first marriage with other women and men, and the defence team realise that this pattern will be very difficult to explain. In regards to finances, however, Michael is adamant that the couple were able to liquidate assets at any time if needed, and although they had debt and credit cards, 
but this was more due to convenience than a sign of financial trouble. Finances will continue to be the topic of conversation again, but on October 29th, 2002, Caitlin files a wrongful death suit against Michael, which will progress through the next couple of years. However, another secret is soon to come out that will become more of a concern for the defence. The prosecution start to look into Michael's history and his time in Germany. Elizabeth Ratliff's unexpected death has some similarities to Kathleen's and they feel this cannot be overlooked. Elizabeth is also discovered at the bottom of the stairs. Michael Peterson is also the last person to see Elizabeth at a similar time of night as Kathleen. A large amount of blood was present at both scenes. Both victims were in their 40s, no evidence of forced entry, and Michael was the one that reported to the authorities that death was by accidental fall. The defence team want to get in front of this story and don't want to be blindsided at trial, so travel to Germany to meet with Michael Peterson's ex-wife Patty to discuss Elizabeth's death and to visit the scene. Luckily, the new tenant doesn't seem to mind the intrusion and measurements of the staircase where Elizabeth was discovered are taken. Patty reminisces about the day of Elizabeth's death. In the days prior, Elizabeth had complained of severe headaches and although she had a dislike of doctors, she had made an appointment for the following week. The night before she was discovered deceased, Patty and Michael had been at Elizabeth's home for dinner with the children. As was customary in recent times, Michael stayed with Elizabeth and the girls while Patty returned home with the boys. Michael helped to clear the plates and read the girls' stories before bed and then headed home. The next morning, Barbara the nanny would find Elizabeth's body at the bottom of the stairs. Panicked, she ran to the Peterson home which was close by. She saw Patty and Michael and asked that they return to the home with her. Michael got dressed and accompanied Barbara back to the house, touching Elizabeth and advising Barbara that she was dead. Michael then called the authorities. A doctor attended, performed a spinal tap and determined that Elizabeth had suffered a brain hemorrhage. Patty recalls watching events unfold and the grief that consumed the couple and all who knew Elizabeth. Patty states that there was little blood at the scene, despite what reports say, and it was a death of natural causes. Rudolph goes on to ask Patty if there is any possibility that Michael and Liz were romantically involved, to which Patty assures him that this would never happen. She's certain that no affair took place and that the relationship was purely platonic. In a strange twist, the black cat poster Le Chat Noir which is seen prominently hanging above where Kathleen died in the Durham mansion, also hung at the bottom of the stairs where Elizabeth perished. A silent observer to two mysterious deaths. In June 2003, in light of the similarities between Elizabeth Ratliff's death and Kathleen's, German authorities officially reopened the case. Her body, laid to rest in Texas next to her husband, was exhumed after 17 years. A new autopsy was performed. Despite the lack of neutrality and the significant travel and cost involved, the autopsy was conducted by Dr Deborah Radish, the same medical examiner that had performed Kathleen's autopsy. The defence asked that the autopsy be performed in Texas, but this request was denied. The autopsy report found that Elizabeth died from blunt force trauma to the head, likely as a result of an attack, a homicidal attack or assault. A phrase which frustrated Michael's defence team, who deemed the language inflammatory and accusatory. The media began to circulate the story as Michael and his family watched on helpless, unable to change the narrative. Despite this upsetting news, Margaret and Martha, Elizabeth's biological daughters, remained loyal to Michael, insisting that their mother's death was natural and that he had no part in it. While awaiting trial, Michael has time to reflect on the gravity of his situation and the likely outcome. He describes Durham as both corrupt and close-minded. Unlike any other city, Durham appears to live by its own set of rules and normalisations, according to Michael. He feels that the majority of Durham would not understand, or be willing to try and understand, the possibility that his marriage could operate and even thrive in the circumstances he describes. He further discusses the corruption of the police, their tendency to lie about facts and figures, to bolster their statistics and image. In fact, 
Michael had written on this subject many times for the Herald Sun, a local paper he had contributed to until his unsuccessful mayoral campaign in 1999. After this, the editor felt it would not be a good idea for Michael to continue writing for the paper. He felt that he had lost credibility after Michael was exposed during his campaign as lying about war medals he never received. Michael had alleged he received two Purple Hearts in addition to other medals, but had no documentation for the Purple Heart specifically. He did, however, have two stories as to why he was awarded them, one involving being hit by shrapnel while another soldier stepped in a landmine, which in turn left Michael disabled. During his run for mayor, questions arose after the News and Observer could find no record of this. Michael would then admit he was never awarded any Purple Hearts, and he was in fact injured in a car accident in Japan, not in active combat in Vietnam. He would say he sometimes felt it easier to lie than to tell the truth, or simply omit the facts. He also admitted that Kathleen did not know the truth but would now find out. This was not the first time Michael had failed to be transparent. In an article condemning drunk drivers and campaigning for zero tolerance, Michael failed to mention that he himself had been caught driving under the influence and had had his licence suspended for 30 days in 1993. He would later say he didn't even consider including his own transgression. After all, the article wasn't about him. But many felt upon learning the truth that this was Michael Peterson, again trying to control his public image through storytelling and narrative, leaving out all the parts that cast a shadow in his character. The public had garnered enough opinions about Michael, though, and now it was time to argue the facts in court. And so, the trial of North Carolina versus Michael Peterson began July 1st, 2003, and would last until October. The court is in session and teams sit at their respective sides. Jim Harden, the DA, prepares his charts and diagrams. A blonde, quiet-spoken man, he is an heir of a good southern gentleman, Accompanying Harden, Frida Black, who despite her southern accent, has more the mannerisms of Cruella de Vil. She is swift to speak and appears constantly judgmental and critical, even if without reason. Her face flits from smugness to menacing in the blink of an eye, making her intimidating to those around her. David Rudolph and Thomas Maher sit with Michael, who nervously awaits the beginning of what might be the end. Opening arguments proceed and Harden introduces the case as being one that is diametrically opposed. One side claiming an accident and the other contending first degree murder. Harden echoes this by showing two opposing photos of Kathleen to the jury. As the twelve strangers sit side by side, they have their initial glimpse of the victim. From the first picture, Kathleen smiles warm and inviting happy in a moment caught in time. The second depicts Kathleen's last moment, deceased in a stairwell, surrounded by her own blood. Harden claims the evidence will show a beating with an instrument similar to a blowpoke that took the busy executive's life in her own home, an exquisite but an expensive home. Harden will show was at risk due to the financial fire the Petersons found themselves in over $140,000 in credit card debt and the house in need of various costly repairs, Kathleen's company was struggling and laying people off, a prospect that Kathleen was fearful of. Harden would go on to claim Michael enjoyed his lavish lifestyle and continued to spend money the couple didn't have while harbouring a secret life of illicit encounters. Both, Harden would contend, were motives for killing Kathleen as a means to life insurance settlements and payouts that would allow Michael to continue his extravagant lifestyle and also afford him the freedom to pursue others romantically. The defence would address some of these issues in their opening argument as well as some that Harden did not. Rudolph contested that the Petersons were fine financially. In fact, Kathleen had recently been promoted, despite the company laying others off. Similarly, Kathleen and Michael owned rental properties which could have been sold if necessary. Kathleen, 
chose to defer 80% of her salary and bonuses for 2000 and 2001, but could apply to access this in the case of hardship, and so money was available if the couple needed it. Rudolph reads statements from family and friends, including Caitlin, portraying Michael as an excellent stepfather and a wonderful husband. He will show, he claims, that the state's expert had tunnel vision from the beginning and had tried to fit evidence to match the theory. From the blood expert to the medical examiner, Rudolph intends to show that there is no basis for their conclusions. Rudolph also discusses the Ratliff death and said that he will illustrate that there are no coincidental similarities between the two, except Michael being innocent of both. Paramedics James Rose and Ron Page were first in the scene and testify about entering the home and assessing Kathleen. Todd Peterson arrived at the same time as the paramedics and as they attempted to find any signs of life, Todd would declare that Kathleen was dead to his father. James asks Michael about any relevant medication, health history and Kathleen's date of birth, all questions which will go unanswered. The smell of blood is overpowering, and within a minute or two, both men determine that Kathleen cannot be saved. There is no electrical activity in her heart, and the blood around her has begun to dry and appears smeared in places. Kathleen's pupils are dilated and show a lack of oxygen to the brain. The paramedics deem the fall as suspicious and call the police to take over the scene. Under cross-examination, both paramedics admit that although the blood seemed dry, that neither actually touched the blood and could not be certain how long Kathleen had been lying there. Similarly, none of the men had mentioned the dry blood in the report, and so the defence would argue it could not have been that significant. Other first responders and subsequent law enforcement officers testify about blood spots in the house, but conflicting reports about how secure the scene was makes any evidence unreliable. Luminal testing shows blood in a laundry room and in the sink, but Todd and his friends were able to walk around the house after hugging Michael, and so blood could have been transferred onto cabinets and floor areas and other places where it might not otherwise have been. Nortel employees are questioned next. First, a personnel worker, Catherine Kaiser, dressed smartly and confident in her extensive knowledge of the company procedures, she effortlessly answers the prosecution's questions. She discusses the benefits packages that Kathleen had available at Nortel. Kathleen earned $145,000 a year when she passed away and was in a director-level position. She had purchased stock in Nortel, which had dropped in value throughout the years. And although Kathleen would still make a profit, after taxes it was minimal in comparison to what she could have earned previously. But despite this, Kathleen sold stock and also chose to drastically reduce how much of her salary she was deferring. For the years 2000 and 2001, Kathleen had chosen to defer 80% of salary and bonuses to a compensation plan she would access in her later years. However, for the upcoming year, 2002, Kathleen had changed this to have only 10% deferred. The prosecution argue that this is due to the Petersons' need for money to live on. Kathleen was the main breadwinner for the family, and Michael had not been making any money recently. And so, the prosecution argued, money was tight. Kathleen also had a life insurance plan at Nortel, which would pay five times her salary if she died. If the death was an accident, this doubled, and the beneficiary would receive over $1 million. They would also receive her 401k fund, pension fund, and her deferred compensation fund, all of which totaled over $340,000. Michael had received some payouts, but the life insurance was being contested due to a technicality. Kathleen had named Michael as a beneficiary, but had never officially signed the form. An unexpected hurdle, the prosecution claim, that Michael Peterson did not anticipate. Another Nortel employee, Kim Barker from HR, will also take the stand. She has a gentle voice and smiles while shaking or nodding her head. A sympathetic look stays on her face. She is reminded constantly by lawyers that she must answer out loud for the jury and for the transcript. 
she advises the court that Nortel were downsizing, and an optimisation list was created to determine who would be axed from the company as a cost-saving measure. Kathleen was placed in this list, but was removed soon after. No one knows for sure if Kathleen knew about this, but correspondence with her sister suggests that she expected it and was afraid that she would soon be unemployed. If this were to happen, the prosecution state, she would no longer be eligible for those life insurance benefits, and so Michael had acted quickly upon that knowledge. The defence, however, counter that Kathleen was still employed and would continue to be employed for the foreseeable future. She also had more stock she could sell if she needed to, and she had recently been promoted. Also, the family had health insurance through Kathleen's company, and without Kathleen, this would mean that Michael would have an extra financial expense, and so would be disadvantaged financially. A financial analyst, Raymond Jung, would argue for the prosecution that recently Kathleen and Michael had been liquidating a lot of assets that had not been replaced by any others, indicating that immediate cash flow was paramount to any long-term investments. Emails relating to Michael's financial situation would also be read out in court. From Todd Markley, a technological expert in forensic science for the prosecution, slim and awkward, Markley would be more comfortable behind a computer screen as he was most days for his job. He's timid, but detailed in his answers. Markley reported that Michael had deleted 216 files the day before Kathleen's death and 352 files two days after. Markley had recovered deleted emails, which were read to the jury. In one, Michael had asked Patty, his ex-wife, to take out a loan to help his sons continue to live nicely. They both had debt and were spending more than their means, and Michael had wanted Patty to cover these costs, at least in the short term. He signed off, it is not possible for me to discuss this with Kathleen. Similarly, Michael had asked Thomas Ratliff, Martha and Margaret's uncle, for money for tuition. A further email was recovered sent from Michael to Kathleen discussing social plans, but also suggesting that they need to work in their marriage. The prosecution say that the Peterson relationship was beginning to crumble. Coincidentally, an email was also sent to Kathleen, but had been sent to Michael's address. This email had been sent by a colleague at Nortel and included a presentation that was never opened despite Kathleen needing to familiarise herself with the contents for the purpose of her conference call the next day. The colleague, Helen Prithlinger, whom had sent the email, had called Kathleen on Friday afternoon and then left a voicemail on Saturday evening for Kathleen at home. She had actually called and left a second voicemail after realising she may have omitted the time of the conference call in the first one. Kathleen had called Helen back as she had accidentally deleted the second voicemail by mistake and still needed to clarify the time of the conference call. The two had a discussion about work around 11.08pm. As Kathleen needed the presentation and did not have her laptop as she had taken Friday off work, she had asked Michael for the home email address to allow Helen to send the presentation and it was sent to Michael's email address beginning M P writer. Kathleen, Helen said, had planned to be in Canada on Monday the 10th of December, the day after she died, but of course she would never make it. Of the deleted files, Markley also recovered and accessed a large amount of adult material on Michael's home computer relating to men seeking men, a lot of which was deleted the days before and after Kathleen's death. In the start menu where the regular Microsoft programs are launched, there were additional programs. A Nortel program, presumably for Kathleen, and the rest, adult programs. Markley suspects that when Michael was surfing these adult sites, that these programs were saved without his knowledge, due to malicious software. But these would have been seen by anyone accessing the start bar. The prosecution seemed to indicate 
that possibly Kathleen discovered these programs when trying to access the email she was expecting, then confronted Michael, which may have led to her death. Officer A.D. McCallop also discussed this work email. He had been tasked with guarding both Todd and Michael the morning Kathleen died. He had watched Michael checking emails and surfing the internet when Michael began reading Kathleen's email from her Nortel colleague aloud between the hours of 4 and 5 a.m. Hardly the actions of a grieving man, the prosecutor suggests. Michael never took the stand in his own defence and so could not be questioned about whether Kathleen had prior knowledge of his illicit affairs. But one man who was solicited by Michael could at least give some insight. Brent Wilgamot, who went by Brad on an escort website, testified that Michael had contacted him in August 2001 under the name MP Writer. The two had exchanged numerous emails and Brent quoted $150 an hour for his services. Michael had arranged a meeting on September 5, 2001 at one of his properties, but the meeting never came to pass as Brent failed to attend. He did mention that Michael was complimentary about his wife and their conversations and had said that no one would ever destroy their marriage. Brent also alluded to the fact that many married men hire him and have lifestyles similar to Michael's and the situation was common. The prosecution argue that either way, it demonstrates infidelity in Michael's part, something that Kathleen left her first husband for. More experts were called upon to testify but this time regarding Kathleen's injuries. For the prosecution, Thomas Bolden, professor of medicine and neuropathologist. He had studied Kathleen's brain after the incident and due to the presence of a small number of red neurons in the cerebral cortex and cerebellum, he was able to garner that the brain had reduced blood flow for quite some time. These red neurons, he assessed, indicate that Kathleen continued to lose blood for approximately two hours before she died. The defence struggled to contest this, but try and suggest it may have been around 45 minutes. Thomas Bolden, however, is an impeccable expert and assures him that this is not the case. Whatever the alibi of Michael Peterson, he is certain that Kathleen continued to lose blood for two hours until she died. Dwayne Deaver, the blood spatter analyst for the prosecution, testified after conducting various experiments and tests that he believes Kathleen was beaten to death in the stairwell. Various videos are shown of Deaver trying to recreate the spatter using a sponge, buckets of blood and ladders. Tall and balding, he clambers around a replica of the stairway reported to cost $7,000, beating a sponge mercilessly and checking the results. He enthusiastically shares with the jury evidence that the blood spatter on the inside of Michael's shorts indicate that he had to have been standing directly above Kathleen at some point while beating her. There would be no other way, he exclaims, that the blood would be in that location otherwise. Medical examiner Dr Deborah Radish agrees with the theory of a beating. Dr Radish wears eyeglasses and her salt and pepper hair reaches past her shoulders. Her voice sounds both cool and indignant similar to the bodies she inspects daily. She talks a jury through Kathleen's injuries, seven lacerations all the way through to the scalp. She intimates that this was not caused by a fall down the steps. When the prosecution asked if a blowpoke might be responsible, handing her a replica, she holds it firmly without emotion and replies, yes, in my opinion, could be. At cross-examination, the defence question why, if beaten, Kathleen had no skull fractures, no brain bruising, none of her bones were broken. Rudolph places folders in the witness stand, containing the files of 257 cases of beatings, all showing skull fractures and contusions. Kathleen had none. Dr Radish's coolness turns to annoyance. Her eyebrows lower and she seems exasperated by the defence's line of questioning and the dramatic introduction of so many full binders she now sits surrounded by. Still, Rudolph continues asking Dr Radish if she's familiar with a similar case in Canada, where a man, initially accused of beating his wife to death, was exonerated 
after it was found by forensic experts that she had fallen and injured herself fatally in the staircase in their home. Dr Radish indicates that she has heard of it. So, Rudolph continues, injuries that you might not expect from a fall can come from a fall, right? Dr Radish reluctantly nods. Leaning back in her chair, she answers quietly, Yes. Rudolph has experts of his own to discern what caused Kathleen's injuries. Dr Henry Lee, the blood spatter analyst, gives physical demonstrations in court, staining Rudolph's suit by mistake and inciting giggles from the jury. Dr Lee, small and joyful, laughs often in the witness stand, joking with the lawyers and the jury. He jokes about how much he will charge, how busy his schedule is, before terming Dwayne Deaver's experiments as flawed and child's play. When the prosecution asks why he wrote that Deaver was one of the best in a copy of his book that he gifted to Deaver, Dr. Lee erupts into laughter, explaining that in his culture, the Chinese people believe in manners, and he could not in good faith write an inscription that read that Deaver was a lousy scientist, even if it was true. The jury laugh along until order is restored. Dr. Lee, however, was not the perfect defence witness for Michael's case. He indicates again that there is too much blood for either a fall or a beating, and when asked what caused the injuries, he says plainly, I don't know. No one can exclude anything. Dr. Faris Bandak, a biomechanics specialist for the defence, provides the jury an animation of how a fall could result in Kathleen's injuries. Their cartoonish figure hurtles down the stairs, hitting various points before landing in a similar position as to how Kathleen was found. Dr. Bandak believes that this is much more likely than a beating. The Ratliff death is discussed, and witnesses and experts give both their memories and their opinions with similarities being raised in Kathleen's case. There's also an affidavit from a neighbour of Elizabeth's. It states that on the night before Elizabeth was discovered, that Michael left the property late, slamming the door and running away, something she found to be very suspicious. The defence, however, argue all of the points individually, but the prosecution contend that the case needs to be viewed in totality. In their opinion, Michael had laid a blueprint of a murder, disguised as an accidental fall, that he would then go on to try and use in Kathleen's death. Two days before closing argument, Michael calls his attorneys at home at 2.30am. His son Clayton has found the blowpoke gifted to Kathleen in the garage. Rudolph contacts a professional photographer who takes high quality pictures of the blowpoke with cobwebs and dust, showing it undisturbed. None of the team are sure how they will introduce this at court. Rudolph suggests that Clayton be called to discuss how he came to find it, but Michael won't allow this. He knows that Clayton will be targeted by the prosecution. Back in the early 90s, Clayton was a freshman at Duke. After delaying his entry due to a DUI, he was finally there and focused on having fun. However, spring break was approaching and Clayton had lost his fake ID. Not wanting to miss out in any of the fun his friends planned to have at Myrtle Beach, he formulated a plan. He had long been obsessed with bombs and explosives since he was a child. He had borrowed a copy of the anarchist cookbook at a young age and made his own explosive. He never detonated his first explosive, he just wanted to know that he could. He did detonate two further explosives, blowing up a phone booth and detonating one in a lake. And now Clayton would put these skills to use again by making a bomb as a diversion. He would break into a university building, steal a laminating machine, cards and a camera. He would create a fake ID using this equipment, but hoped that law enforcement would be thrown off thinking the bomb was a protest to recent student drinking crackdowns. Despite claiming he rigged it not to explode, he was arrested and sentenced to four and a half years in prison. He would not be a good witness for Michael and the defence team decide against calling him. Instead, Rudolph brings the poker to court and admits it into evidence. The prosecution are unimpressed, but claim that they never said it was the exact blowpoke, just something similar. Closing arguments begin with the defence. Rudolph speaks to the jury about his belief 
that there's a vendetta against Michael. He had spoken poorly about law enforcement in Durham and was critical of the DA department in newspaper articles, which he feels had led to the department trying to frame him. A battle of egos but the prosecutions was bigger, and they'd corrupted the evidence to suit the theory. He disregards the Ratliff case completely, saying there's no similarities, and in fact Michael had raised Elizabeth's two daughters, hardly the actions of a cold, calculating killer. He references all of his expert witnesses, and then Rudolph focuses much of his closing argument on the newly discovered blowpoke, saying that now there is no murder weapon, there is no beating. He also points to the lack of injuries normally seen in beatings, and asks the jury to consider these facts while deliberating. The prosecution begin their closing arguments by encouraging the jury to recall all of the ways in which they've witnessed Michael failing to honour his married vows to Kathleen, his contact with escort, the adult material on his computer. All of this destroy any indication that this was a happy and idyllic marriage. Furthermore, the 911 call was deceitful in the prosecutor's opinion, the first act in a story created by Michael Peterson, a fictional writer, that would play out badly. Every first responder felt the scene was suspicious in one way or another, and the prosecution contend that the scene was staged to appear accidental. Michael had adequate time as Kathleen lay dying for two hours to ensure the props were set. They believe Michael positioned the body, tried to clean certain areas, and took off his shoes and socks. Luminol testing showed blood residue in the laundry room and blood in another sink, part of the clean-up operation the prosecution state. The prosecution also contend that Elizabeth Ratliff was Michael Peterson's first victim. He got away with it then and thought he would, again. He thought the state wouldn't be as smart as him. He didn't administer CPR before first responders arrived, would not answer their questions, and then focused his attention on surfing the internet and checking emails. Todd and his friends were drunk and belligerent, contaminating the scene despite being asked not to, a further hindrance for law enforcement that shows little concern for anyone, especially Kathleen. Blood spatter analyst shows a beating and the couple's finances indicate that they needed to change their lifestyle drastically. The prosecution asked the jury to simply consider, in light of all that has been presented to them, was this an accident or not? As the jury deliberations begin, Michael considers the outcome, but advises that he's at peace with himself. Every day that passes brings more stress and worry for the family, but everyone tries to stay busy. Rudolph sits back in his chair, his earphones in, awaiting the knock of the jury. Thomas Maher reads a book or works on his laptop. Michael and his children sit talking. And then the jury returns with a verdict. Guilty. Guilty of first-degree murder. Michael is then immediately sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. The prosecution hug each other in celebration, as Michael glances back at his children. It's okay, he says, before heading away to be locked up forever. His family began to sob, and Rudolph and the defence team appear defeated both in verdict and in mind. They state they will appeal, but for now there appears to be some finality to the case. However, in many ways, the case of Michael Peterson is just beginning. In November 2011, Michael Peterson sits in a prison cell, He's spent the last eight years behind bars and looks very different from the man who stood trial in 2003. His face is drawn in, his wrinkles deepened by the harsh reality of his new life. He can no longer wander aimlessly room to room smoking his pipe and indulging in his prior eccentricities. He is confined and appears unsteady on his feet at times, shuffling forward to metal doors that swing open and bang shut. Until this point, all appeals that were filed on Michael's behalf have failed, and the realisation he may die in prison hangs over him relentlessly. It's been ten years since Kathleen died and Michael's nightmare began. A familiar face, however, reappears. David Rudolph, Michael's attorney at trial, visits and works in the case pro bono. Michael has no funds and likely never will. The wrongful death suit lodged by Caitlin Atwater, Kathleen's daughter, was settled for $25 million. Although stagnant while he's imprisoned, any future earnings may be at risk, should Michael be exonerated. Rudolph is still a defence attorney, but in the eight years Michael has been locked up, other things have changed. D. 
DA Jim Harden is now a Superior Court judge and Frida Black has left the DA's office. Dwayne Deaver, the prosecution's blood spatter analyst, is under intense scrutiny. After a review of the State Bureau of Investigation, found that Deaver had misled jurors and submitted false reports. Deaver had not reported other testing and had been integral in swaying jurors to convict innocent people, based on his misleading testimony. Former inmate Greg Taylor was cleared after 17 years in prison and being convicted to life, due to Deaver misrepresenting results and evidence in his case. Rudolph suspects that this is relevant to Michael's case and is optimistic that the time has come to fight back and to win. Many jurors in Michael Peterson's case based their trial on Deaver's evidence, and so Rudolph uses this as leverage to secure a new hearing for Michael to ask for a new trial. Michael has little faith in the system at this juncture, but is hopeful. Candace, Kathleen's sister, has come prepared with a speech, which turns to screaming rage. Candace has shrew-like features and a volatile demeanour. She shouts about justice for Kathleen, but contorts her face and waves her arms wildly, which makes it hard to relate to her. Those in her presence stare past her, perhaps afraid that she will catch their eye and make them the next target. She storms away angrily to her seat, and the hearing continues in a calmer manner, much to everyone's relief. Judge Orlando Hudson again presides, and as Rudolph tries to state his case, a bomb threat causes an evacuation. The irony of a bomb threat with the Peterson family appears to pass unnoticed, and everyone files back in once the building has been cleared for entry. Rudolph's key evidence to request a new trial is the misleading testimony of Dwayne Deaver. He calls Greg Taylor's attorney to the stand and he recants the conviction of his client based on Deaver's input to the case. Greg and an acquaintance were doing drugs and drinking and decided to take a drive. Travelling down a dark dirt road, the truck gets stuck in a ditch. The men exit the vehicle and find what they believe to be a roll of carpet. On inspection, they discover it is a body in panic. Both men are scared as they're under the influence and run on foot from the scene. The police would find the body in the truck and question Greg. He was convicted based on stains that were found on his truck. Dwayne Deaver provided a report indicating that the stains were blood when he had in fact received a negative result in blood testing but instead he willfully misled the court and Greg was convicted. Kirk Turner's attorney speaks also. Kirk had killed his wife due to self-defence. His wife had attacked him using a viking spear, impaling his leg and causing him to lose almost a quarter of his blood volume. Dwayne Deaver had concluded from his testing that Kirk had staged the scene, inflicting the injuries himself, all of which Dwayne Deaver had concluded from more flawed experiments until he had replicated the same results. A review took place by the assistant FBI director at the time, who was asked to conduct a review to discover if there was any injustice in the State Bureau of Investigation. Inconsistencies were identified where the final report did not match the tests, and a further 34 cases where Dwayne Deaver himself had misrepresented the results. The DA would argue that the rest of the evidence presented at the Peterson trial was still more than enough to convict Michael. However, the previous conflicts, plus additional evidence showing Deaver was not as qualified as he told the jury, led to Judge Hudson granting Michael a new trial. Michael was then released in house arrest with an ankle monitor and was allowed his first taste of freedom in eight years. He moved to a little apartment and began to ready himself for the looming second trial, the original film crew continued to document Michael's story as he awaited another chance in front of a jury. He is able to hug his family for the first time in eight years and spend time with them alone at home. He has an ankle monitor, but he is happy. The family drink champagne and celebrate, but Michael is fundamentally different. He's not the same person. He's been greatly affected by being institutionalised. He shares that he's emotional for no reason and is unable to accept what he has lost, but also what he has regained. He had not readied himself to experience it ever again, and now it's difficult. 
Rudolph meets with Michael to discuss the options ahead. He's confident that they might not need to go to trial in light of the Deaver scandal. He discusses an offered plea with Michael. They consider the likelihood of what that will mean. Michael would be guilty in record, a technicality that he's conflicted about. He wants to be declared innocent. The trial will be stressful and may end in conviction again, and so he must consider what's more important in the long term. In 2014, Michael returns to court, this time to ask for permission to remove the ankle bracelet and house arrest conditions. This is granted, but not before Candace, Kathleen's sister, pleads with the judge not to allow this. She shrieks that she's fearful Michael will flee the country or may possibly kill her or her family. The judge and the rest of the room continue to look away, hoping not to catch her eye before moving on. And Michael leaves. The state then approach Rudolph regarding a plea deal. Roger Eccles is the new DA and is hoping to close this chapter for everyone. Michael remains unsure and hopes that the case will be dismissed. Rudolph finds this unlikely and urges Michael to seriously consider the plea deal. Again, they meet to discuss the offered plea. Michael will accept, but only with conditions. He does not want to speak the word guilty. He wants the charge to be one of manslaughter, and he wants to be let go in time served, with no possibility of returning to prison for any length of time. The DA will not accept this, due to Candace and the family refusing to allow Michael to not admit any guilt. And so it would appear that the trial will go ahead as scheduled. In 2016, tired and drained, Rudolph advises Michael that he cannot take part in another trial, but recommends a lawyer who will. The lawyer meets with Michael and everything progresses well. In fact, while trying to obtain the original evidence, the new lawyer discovers that none of this has been kept in the proper casings and is now contaminated. In one box, which is marked as evidence for the Peterson trial, there are items from another case entirely. Based on this, the lawyer is hopeful that the case can be dismissed. Unfortunately, before he can argue this on Michael's behalf, the lawyer suffers a stroke and cannot continue the case. Another lawyer steps in, and at the hearing, where Michael's team argue the testing is now impossible because the clothes are contaminated, she says that the case should be dismissed. The judge rules that the trial will go ahead and that this contamination, although unprofessional and a setback, was not due to any process violation error, but rather a misfortune that happened when the storage facility moved premises. Michael is contemplating what the next few years might be like, back and forth to court and how it will end. He calls Rudolph, asks him to broker a plea deal on his behalf. He doesn't want to go to another trial again. Rudolph suggests that first, they file motions to suppress the Germany case and the search warrant evidence, which would then omit the adult material and emails. He believes that if the DA thinks that Michael is still willing to fight, that this will give them some leverage for a plea deal. Michael explains it to his family. He wants to take the plea deal, but asks for their input. The reviews are mixed. The girls, Margaret and Martha, are willing to go to trial again, better experienced this time round for the media and the public. But Michael's sons want him to leave the rat trap of the state, even if this means pleading guilty to do it. Rudolph receives a call from the DA, agreeing to the Alford plea with a manslaughter charge. He suspects that the motions they filed worked, and without those key pieces of evidence, the trial would be pointless for the DA. Instead of jubilation, Michael is torn, because if the evidence was disallowed, he may finally be found not guilty at trial and have the chance to be free completely. But the offered plea would end it now. Rudolph believes that the DA will go to trial regardless, due to Kathleen's family, and asks Michael to seriously consider the plea deal. Michael feels like he's been punished for doing something he says he didn't do, even after it's been proven that the state lied and cheated throughout the trial, but they will never be held accountable. Ultimately, Michael takes the plea deal because he doesn't trust the system. He loses, but he doesn't care. He can live with it. Rudolph was also secretly considering whether they should try the case again. But, he concludes, Michael will never be innocent, only not guilty. And there's no benefit in that for anyone concerned. 
In 2017, Michael and Rudolph finalise the plea deal, ready to end the saga for good. The final sticking point is that Michael doesn't want to say the word guilty, and so they configure the deal in such a way that while Michael agrees to plead guilty, he will never actually speak the word guilty at the hearing. At court, Candace roams, ready to strike. She gives an impact speech about the way that the family continues to be re-traumatised by Michael. She gestures and screams and shouts at Rudolph and Michael while both look on, unfazed. She is dismissive of the documentary crew and declares Michael guilty forever before publicly considering whether she may be the all-powerful Wizard of Oz since everyone thinks that she has so much power. In many ways, it's a fitting end to her input to the case. Everyone moves on quickly and the plea is accepted. Michael is free to go. The legalities have been completed and Michael can leave. Candace continues her tirade outdoors and with reporters she notes an innocent man doesn't plead guilty as she smiles smugly at the cameras. Michael speaks with reporters too. He explains he'd no other choice but to enter the plea and he needed to take this opportunity to move on. He says that he's lost Kathleen and that loss is worse than any verdict he had today. Judge Orlando Hudson, who was present through all of Michael's legal battles, shares his opinion. He says the justice system works because Michael was released. He accepts that Michael maybe never should have been imprisoned, but the jury convicted on the evidence that they had. They had no idea that it was flawed. And if he was to try the case over again from the beginning, he may have done some things differently. He may have disallowed the Ratliff case and the adult material from the very beginning, as he feels it did create prejudice against Michael, but at the time, he felt differently. Information would also come to light in 2017 that Michael had been involved in a romantic relationship with one of the film crew for 13 years. Sophie Burnett was an editor of the documentary series, and they were together for over a decade. She says nothing happened with them until the first documentary was completed. From 2004 to 2017, they were romantically linked. Sophie was married with a child, but divorced her husband to be with Michael. They mutually ended their relationship because the long distance wouldn't work. Various other theories have been put forward regarding Kathleen's death. Over the years, people have attempted to provide answers that satisfy all of the evidence. One convincing theory is that Kathleen was returning to the home when she was attacked by an owl. Barred owls are both territorial and had been responsible for a string of attacks in the area on joggers and animals. A neighbour had actually alerted the police to this at the beginning of the investigation in 2002, but the theory had been dismissed. The talons of the barred owl would have easily ripped his skin without causing any skull fractures, and Kathleen was found to be holding microscopic feathers and cedar needles at the time of her death. As Kathleen ran inside, she may have reached the staircase and tried to sit down and stem the bleeding, coughing out blood as it poured down her face. Due to the volume of blood loss, she may have fallen unconscious. She may have regained consciousness again before collapsing and bleeding to death. In the two hours she lay there, many believe that Michael discovered Kathleen, but rather than call for help, he simply walked away, believing her to already be dead or waiting for her to succumb to the blood loss. He may have reasoned that Kathleen had fallen down the stairs as that's where he discovered her, and saw an opportunity to gain both a traumatic life experience that he could write about in the future, but also an accidental life insurance payout. He may have wandered outside for hours trying to bolster his alibi before finally calling 911 when he was sure that Kathleen had stopped breathing. In his mind, given that it was an accident, he perhaps felt that it would be an open and shut case, and it may have been, except for the fact that Kathleen had severe lacerations from the owl attack that Michael could not explain away. How could he? He genuinely believed that she had fallen down the stairs. He was not prepared for hidden wounds. Michael believed the evidence would match what he thought had happened. He had no notion that the lacerations would spark a murder inquiry and that he would be at the centre of it. If he'd known about the lacerations prior to calling 911, he may have suggested an intruder. 
but the lacerations were a surprise to him, and by then it was too late. Michael had already started his story and set up the plot. Neither the prosecution or the defence could explain the injuries fully, because neither had considered that a bird of prey may be the cause, and so both failed to fully convey the cause. But I guess it's just a theory. Michael is now free and continues to write, with all profits going to charity. He was a companion to Patty, his ex-wife, until her death in 2021, and he is an active grandfather. Caitlin is a mother herself now, and everyone has moved on. No one will ever know what happened in the staircase except Kathleen, but stories will continue to try and theorise long after Michael passes too. Thank you for joining me. And come again for the next horror, mystery or crime story. Goodbye.